Welcome to the Longevity Week podcast hosted by the Longevity Forum. We will be featuring podcasts all week on the theme, The Age of Resilience, which you can catch online, thelongevityforum.com. Please note this podcast was recorded before the latest set of lockdown measures were announced and prior to the latest decision of the Monetary Policy Committee. On this episode, Andrew J. Scott, co-founder of the Longevity Forum and professor of economics at LBS, will be interviewing Andy Haldane, chief economist at the Bank of England. Now to you, Andrew. Thank you, Laura. And it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to be talking to Andy Haldane, the chief economist at the Bank of England. Uh, Thank you, Andy, for sparing the time to be with us today. Uh, It's a busy time for policymakers these days. Well, thank you, Andrew. Fantastic to be doing this podcast with with you. And you're right, we've been busy. I think most of the world has been busy, policy-wise, certainly, right across the central bank community. We've been busily doing what we can to keep the economy strong. And the same has been true of you know, policymakers right around the world, and indeed businesses. You know, I, don't, I know no one who hasn't been uh, run off their feet during the course of this year, but it's um, great to be here and chatting about these issues. Yeah, and, you know, it's extraordinary. We, sort of, you know, we spend our time studying business cycles, and, you know, we always think about, oh, there's a shock, and then that triggers a fluctuation. And, of course, in economics, we spend a lot of time trying to identify the shock. What is the cause of it? But this one, it's pretty obvious, and there's this huge, big impact so how do you think the economy has fared given the scale of this shock and how do you feel recovery has been going to date and you know what do you think about going forward well lots in there i mean you're right it was a extraordinary step down you know pretty much unprecedented i'd say in both its speed and its scale and, and as you said the as you mentioned andrew there's no surprises about what the cause of it was you know the combination of uh, the virus plus um, the accompanying uh, health containment uh, measures. I think since then, what we've seen by way of recovery, and uh, you whisper it quietly, but we've probably five months into recovery now, has been a bit quicker than most, perhaps many would have expected. That's true here in the UK. Actually, it's true right round the world. The bounce back has been a, a bit faster. Uh, why is that? Why has that been? Well, I mean, I think one feature that stands out for me as being surprising, perhaps even remarkable, Andrew, actually, is just how resilient and flexible households have been, consumers have been, in the face of all of this adversity. You know, despite all of that adversity, we now have you know already consumer spending back up to pre-COVID levels despite the losses of income despite the losses of job despite the health issues that of course remain very large uh, even now so it's been a stronger than expected recovery and that's been a, a real source of reassurance of course that doesn't mean looking ahead that it will continue there are risks of plenty and you need only open a newspaper or switch on the news to see what those risks are. The, of course, re-emergence of the virus at real pace uh, is one of them. Uh, developments in the jobs market looking forward uh, would be a second. And then, of course, there's a small matter of us leaving the customs union with the EU at the end of the year. So there's, there's certainly risks there. But so far, at least, the story has been one of surprising strength and surprising resilience, I'd say. I, I tend to agree with you. And, I, and of course, the other thing that's, I think, striking about this this time is that, you know, we keep using business cycle language of recessions, et cetera, for this, but it is such a different dynamic. You know, that normally you get a shock that builds up and accumulates and gets worse, and then you start to see recovery. But this was this huge initial fall, and then you know, there's something of a bounce back, and as you say, perhaps even an encouraging one. But how does that complicate things within the Monetary Policy Committee? Because we're so used to sort of thinking about a different set of dynamics. So what's the challenges been uh, intellectually uh, for the MPC and even monitoring the data? Yeah, I mean, some big challenges on both fronts. Let me maybe discuss both briefly. I mean, on the sort of making sense of what this crisis is, plainly it's a twin crisis. It's both, it's rooted, of course, in a health crisis, but it's morphed into being a crisis for the economy too. And we don't have lots of experience historically of, of how people behave when facing those twin 
threats, sort of double jeopardy of risks to both their life and to their livelihood. So that's been a challenge. You know, how behaviorally would people react? As you mentioned, Andrew, this is a world away from being a, a conventional business cycle. There's an element of this that's cyclical in the sense that activity has been laid low and a gap has opened up between output and its potential uh, level. But in other respects, this has been a shock that's been structural rather than cyclical. There's been a you know, fundamental reconfiguration of the way people go about working, the way people go about spending, the way businesses go about operating. And of course, some of those changes will probably abate, but a number will stick around. And therefore, we're talking about structural change. We're talking about shifts in the supply side of the economy every bit as much as in the demand side of the economy. But quite what that balance is between demand and supply is tremendously uncertain right now and has certainly been a tremendous challenge when it comes to the setting of policy. I mean, facing that uncertainty, what can you do? Well, the one or two of the things that we've done, you know, rather mechanistically, we've we've widened the 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 range of our so-called fan charts around our forecasts to recognise that uncertainty. We've done much more by way of scenario analysis. You know, we're in a world of genuinely multiple equilibrium being possible, not least given the fortunes of the virus. So to even talk in terms of you know central paths might be a, a bit optimistic right now. And the third thing we've done, I think this bridges to the second part of your question, Andrew. You know, facing an economy moving around at such speed and such significant shifts, it puts a massive premium on monitoring the economy in as close to real time as possible. And we and others around the world have made a pretty hefty investment in a suite of you know, so-called fast indicators, often drawing upon you know, rather heterodox, at least in central banking terms, data sets, you know, whether it's you know, footfall in the high street or traffic flows on the roads or on the railways or making extensive use of fintech apps or payment systems data to get you know, only a very granular read on the economy but also a close to real time read on the economy we've found ourselves you know quite heavily reliant on that real time read to make sense of an economy that's been moving around at incredible pace and where shocks are coming along on an almost daily basis that could have you know pretty profound implications for how the economy fares yeah, I think that side of it is fascinating how, you know, we used to look at the, the mainly aggregate or sectoral data and now that heterogeneity is really coming through, which I'd be interested in what effect that has on the frequency of meetings and decisions and, and directions of, of policy. Now, you know, we're talking about resilience here of the economy and you said in some sense the economy has proved itself to be more resilient than one might have feared. And obviously you talked about those big sectoral shift that's happening, which is unusual. We had another big shock, a uh, global financial crisis, 2007, eight. And in response, governments put in place a big change in banking regulation and capital requirements. What's sort of looking back to that uh, change, how has that helped this time around in terms of resilience, do you think? I think it's helped a huge amount, Andrew. I think it, it, along two distinct dimensions, actually. I mean, one and the most immediate and obvious, I think, has been that, I think Mark Carney put it actually, just as the crisis was commencing, you know, this time we'd hoped, perhaps even expected, that the financial sector would be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I think very largely that has been the case, that there haven't been anything like the same concerns about the resilience, the robustness of the banking system. And as a result, the banking system has been able to contribute to bridging over what were some pretty significant cash flow shortfalls in large parts of, in particular, the corporate sector. You know, many millions of loans have been made 
uh, by British banks uh, over the course of the past few months. The extraordinary scale of lending, of course, that's been helped in many cases by uh, underwriting insurance from the government. That has certainly helped banks make those loans av- available. Nonetheless, I think you know, without those loans having been forthcoming, we'd have faced a much bigger problem in the corporate sector. Those cash flow shortfalls would have tripped up many more corporates by now with adverse consequences for jobs right across the country. So I think you know, by and large, I would say, the reforms put in place 10, 12 years ago have shown to be very much worthwhile for just situations like this. You know, we ran those stress tests before this event, and they gave us confidence that banks had enough in the tank. So when that stress came along, as it surely has this year, there was indeed enough in the tank, and that fuel has been used through this year to keep the economy recovering. Uh, so I think overall, I would say that's an important indication of, of why resilience matters. And that bridges, Andrew, really to my second point, which is you know, the, the lesson we learned when it came to financial services 10, 12 years ago is one we now need to relearn when it comes to the non-financial parts of the economy. Because the truth is, when push came to shove, as it did at times through this year, we saw parts of the non-financial sector uh, struggling, struggling to supply goods and services people needed in the same way as you know banks 10, 12 years ago struggled to provide the loans that people needed. And I look, for example, at global supply chains. We went through a you know halcyon period, post-war period of those global supply chains broadening and deepening. But during this year, we saw some fracturing of those global supply chains in ways that meant that some of the everyday essentials that people wanted, I'm thinking pasta and paracetamol and masks and medicines, were in short supply, in some cases far too short supply. And that too is a resilience lesson for us to learn about both global supply chains and domestic supply chains. And I hope that one of the lessons we take away, similar to the lesson we took away 10, 12 years ago, is the need to think hard about how we secure not just the efficiency of those, if you like, production networks, but also their resilience, certainly for those goods and services that we really need uh, at uh, all times. So that's a, that, that's a big policy lesson, I think, from, from the past 12 months. And let me try and sort of take that in a couple of dimensions. So one is just around central banking, which you say, you know, the banking monetary policy has been supporting during this time period, but not at the center of policy attention. And you know, it's been an enormous one, but it's been supporting. What do you think we're learning here about the limits of central bank and monetary policy in terms of dealing with the economy and shocks, and particularly given uh, those comments you just made uh, about resilience? Yeah, well, I mean, you're right, Andrew, that there's been a further, you know, very significant stepping up of the degree of monetary accommodation by central banks globally over the course of this year. And in that sense, there's a, there's a parallel with what happened 10, 12 years ago. What is very different, or rather different, than back then is that this time monetary policy has had fiscal policy there to provide very significant amounts of additional support. So I think it struggled outside wartime to think of a time when both the monetary and the fiscal policy taps have been turned on at such speed and at such scale at the same time. And that is indeed what has happened this year. And I would say a jolly good thing that is what happened, because I think without that, the economy would have struggled to an even greater degree than it already has. I mean, I would say in situations like this, given the nature of the shock, if you like, it's only right and proper that fiscal policy plays the leading role because many of the problems we're talking about that could be cash flow problems for sectors 
or problems of targeted job support, you know, fiscal tools are much more nimble and adept at fixing those problems than the rather blunt instrument uh, of monetary policy. So that so that fiscal policy is led, and that monetary policy has played a very important and very significant supporting role. I think is the right mix to have had. There is a question, having used some further monetary firepower, of how much is left. Interest rates are, as as you know, Andrew, at historically very very low levels, probably the lowest ever levels in history, and that at some at some level provides. That means there's less uh, in the tank than was the case at the start uh, of this year. Nonetheless, as, as we've hopefully made clear, there is plainly more that we could do, if not with interest rates, then with our actions in purchasing assets of various types. Already we've we've purchased, you know, or are about to purchase up to three hundred billion pounds of extra assets. And we could do more if the economy required it. So, yes, fiscal has led, and rightly so, but monetary is supported and and could provide more support if needed. I also wonder if the scale of this shock, um, you know, we had two really big shocks now uh, in this little over 10 years with the GFC uh, and COVID. So this issue of resilience, of course, has to get it ever more important. And you talked about how to achieve resilience in the financial sector and how this has been a test of that resilience. And of course, using the balance sheet of the central bank has been a key part of that. I, I wonder if we sort of think about resilience more broadly in society, whether we should also start thinking about sort of the other balance sheets of sort of like environmental assets or social capital, where that actually it goes beyond just the monetary and fiscal policy in terms of how we think about this resilience. I think that that must be right, Andrew. We learned our lesson about financial resilience uh, 10, 12 years ago. We're learning a lesson about economic resilience now, but absolutely they are only two of what is a multifaceted resilience issue. You mentioned a few yourself there. You know, our own personal resilience, our emotional resilience, our mental resilience is an absolutely front and center issue right now. The lockdown that was needed to get on top of the virus plainly has come at some cost in terms of mental health and well-being. I think we need to keep a very, very close weather eye on those issues. Let's take an example. I sit talking to you from from my home. I've worked from home for the past six months, Andrew. I've been into the Bank of England only twice over that period. I don't miss the commute one jot, but do I have a worry that this may have some longer term costs in terms of, say, my social capital, you know, the number of working relationships that I'm able to develop and, and, and build up over time? Yes, I do. I think that's a crucial part of our makeup as human beings and a crucial part of doing our jobs well. So those issues of personal resilience and and mental health, I think, are crucial issues. Environmental resilience, plainly, even before this, were hugely significant and of rising significance. I mean, in in some ways, one of the, the small silver linings from the very dark cloud of this crisis has been that we've made some at least down payment towards hitting our net zero objective by 2050, if only because we're all traveling around a bit less uh, than we were yeah, previously. In terms of keeping score, you know, this plurality of capitals, yes, it's about financial capital. Yes, it's about physical capital. But also, it's about social capital. It's about environmental capital. It's about intellectual capital, our capacity for creativity. Mm. For me, all those. On your point about the resilience, then, because also you've uh, recently been talking about how it's important to avoid being excessively negative about the prospects. So tell me a little bit more about that about that interplay you think between expectations and uh, resilience and the economic performance going forward right now. I mean, it's very hard right now, given the twin crises we face, as I mentioned earlier on, Andrew, to get the balance right in how we communicate about how the world is doing. On the one hand, it's appropriate that we should highlight and flag to people 
the risks that they face, not least from this awful virus. We want some, you know, some cautious behavior when it comes to tackling the virus. Equally, we do not want that caution to translate into fear and foreboding about the future. If you like excessively cautious behavior, risks making a bad situation worse, certainly for the economy, because that will lead people to hold back in their spending, to build up their savings. What Keynes called the paradox of thrift, paradoxical because being thrifty is typically seen as being virtuous, especially in response to risk. But if everyone is collectively virtuous, that risks turning a a virtue into a, a vice. And we need to be very mindful of not eliciting overcautious, excessively anxious behavior, partly because it chews up our mental health, but also because it chews up our spending behavior and therefore the, the performance of the economy. So that's a, there's a balance there to be struck. And do we as individuals always strike that balance in the right place? Well, we know a lot from behavioral psychologists about how people react to situations like this, genuinely existential risks at two levels, you know, risks to lives and risks to livelihoods. We know in those situations, people tend to overestimate the risks that they are facing. It's a something hardwired from our hunter-gatherer past, actually, but very difficult to shake off even now. And that's why, you know, I've been trying to encourage people really to seek as balanced a view as possible of the risks. For sure, they are there. For sure, they are real, Andrew. But we must not overestimate them. Otherwise, there's some risk that that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I've got two final questions, if I can. Uh, And that leads on to it's interesting as economists watching epidemiologists be in the front line in terms of making forecasts and offering uh, data and advice. I just wondered from watching their public uh, performance and debates, what you think economists could learn from them and what the epidemiologists perhaps might learn from economics? Hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. I can't pretend for one second to be an expert in epidemiology. Although I have worked with some epidemiologists yeah. uh, previously, and, and that was a for me tremendously illuminating experience because they had this this box of tricks. It's a box of tricks that's now being used actually. Um, you see it on the telly almost every evening to to make sense of the very nonlinear dynamics you get in disease spread, which you know to some extent uh, are dynamics that that read across to the fortunes of the economy and financial system as well. I think one of the takeaways I've had from observing the epidemiologists during the course of this crisis is, in some ways, it's a, it's a lesson that you and I would know only too well, which is that a model is only as good as its inputs. And that's certainly been true as, uh, of our model models of, of COVID disease spread, which in many cases, you know, have proven to be quite fragile. The bounds of uncertainty have been very considerable, just as they are around our economic models. When you don't have good data on which to calibrate or estimate those models, then those bounds of uncertainty are greater still, and your scope for error is greater still. So in that respect, I think I had quite a lot of sympathy with the the plight facing the epidemiologists, because you know the decision makers, the politicians were requiring certainty uh, in an environment that didn't really lend itself to any degree of certainty uh, about the path of the virus. On that, I think economists and epidemiologists can can find common cause in the fragility and certainty of their models. Perhaps they need more fan charts, perhaps, Dandy. Well, I mean, they actually, they do use them. The, the problem is getting others to focus on them, yeah. I think. Uh, it's as much about, you know, people, especially when the world's uncertain, seek clarity and certainty where it, it, it can't exist. And I think that is a, a problem we're all wrestling with. I, I'm, I'm sure that we haven't, on the economist side, fully resolved it. Well, I know we haven't fully resolved it either. I mean, the only other point I'd make about this is I have felt on occasions, you know, I mentioned this was a twin crisis, a, a crisis of public health and, and, and a crisis for the economy too. In some ways, I don't know that we've always done 
as much as we might to get a sort of balanced perspective on both of those risks. You know, I'd like, I suppose, to have seen a bit more of a blended mix of expertise, absolutely drawing upon the natural scientists and their very considerable expertise on all matters, public health and disease spread. But I do think, importantly, having some social scientists around the table, yeah. not just to inform the public health response, but as importantly, to weigh the implications of all of this for the economy, for communities, for societies, and indeed for personal mental health, is also tremendously important. Because we know that both factors have weighed very heavily on citizens over the course of, uh, of this year. So I think there is something there about the plurality of disciplines, plurality of expertise, plurality of perspectives when it comes to landing on a, on a policy solution. I think that's right. I think also um, the reaction, the interaction between people's behavior and projections of the future, which is obviously something in economics we take very seriously, has also, I think, been an important uh, loop that needed to be put into this. Um, but let me uh, ask one final question, move away from uh, monetary policy matters to another one of your roles, which is chair of the government's Industrial Strategy Council. This uh, podcast is part of Longevity Week and included in uh, Grand Challenges is an ageing society grand challenge. I just wonder what you felt the impact of COVID would be on the agenda around the Industrial Strategy Council and what you're seeing happening. The Industrial Strategy itself was put in place 2017. And you mentioned, Andrew, one of the central planks were the so-called uh, grand challenges, of which one was the challenge of ageing, on which your forum is doing uh, absolutely fantastic work, which I hugely enjoyed and learned from, I should say, over the years. Alongside other grand challenges, I mean, some of the obvious ones like uh, clean growth and, and AI and future mobility. I mean, all of those remain no less grand as challenges as a result of COVID. In fact, in many respects, those challenges have become even more challenging in the light of COVID. What I think we now need, I mentioned earlier on that um, this crisis had been, had been many things, but one of the things it's plainly been is a significant structural shift in the economy, you know, a shift in the sectors that are doing well and those that are doing less well, uh, a shift in the way that we work, the way that we spend, the way that businesses operate. Having had that structural shock, I think now is a good time to have a, a stock take and a refresh, actually, of what UK PLC needs by way of industrial policies and by way of industrial uh, strategies. Let me give you know just one example from a potentially very very long list. It's a very obvious example, but you know what was a digital priority for us as individuals and for businesses, you know, pre-COVID, I would say in the light of COVID has now become an absolute digital necessity. That If you're a business these days, you can't afford not to be digitally match fit. You know, this year uh, of necessity, many firms, indeed many individuals have had to improve their match fitness on all matters digital, but there's a lot further to go. And around that, we need to kind of reframe and refresh a new industrial strategy. You mentioned just a second ago, Andrew, the importance of expectations, the importance of avoiding fearfulness, the, avoid, the importance of avoiding excessive levels of uncertainty. I think one way of achieving that is government laying down some very clear markers about the direction of policy in the period ahead, those sectors that will be uh, supported, that will be grown, and which will generate the jobs of tomorrow. And I think that could make a very important contribution in these very uncertain times to giving people a, a sight of where we might be headed, providing a degree of clarity about the future, I think could really help in strengthening people's expectations and perceptions uh, in the present. 
Yeah, I think that's right. That resilience, of course, requires a connection to the past, but also a connection to the future. And I think that path forward is going to be key. Well, thank you so much, Andy. I won't take any more of your time up. That's been brilliant, wide-ranging conversation. So really appreciate your time and good luck in both your individual and your professional resilience. Well, thank you, Andrew. I've really enjoyed it as ever chatting to you and all the best to you and all the best to the Longevity Forum as well. Thank you very much. This broadcast has been brought to you by the Longevity Forum as part of Longevity Week 2020. We are very grateful to our sponsors, Juvenescence, Hill Dickinson, and Burnbray. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.